Hello, everybody. This is Trip, and I'm here with Tom Ord, and we're going to answer some big God questions. Big God questions, Tom. And uh, uh, how, how are you feeling? Do you feel like you're ready to speak on behalf of ultimate reality? <laughs> I know all absolute truth, so of course I am. <laughs> you know, just today I was, I'm in the midst of writing a book that's uh, meant to be a introduction to open a relational thought for people who don't have graduate degrees in theology. And one section is uh, trying to think about a right-sized God, that some gods are too small, some gods are too big. So when I say these are big God questions, it's not an emphasis on a God who's oversized, but these are big questions about God. And I've got... Uh, oh, yeah. Is it like the Bernard Loomer essay? In the, no, uh, size I know of that. God? I should I should refer to that. I was actually thinking of uh, that book that the adequate God with uh, that Cobb and Pinnock edited. Oh, the search for an adequate God. Search, but... Yes, yeah. Um, I always think of Goldilocks, you know, and the the porridge being too hot, too cold, and just right. Uh, you know, what's a right sized God? You remember when I was younger, there was a really popular book by jb phillips called your god is too small do you ever heard of that book only when people use it to set up their yeah. really amazing sermon about how how big their god is and, <laughs> yeah and then by know, the time they get done you think yeah if god's that big then god's responsible for every evil thing how big <laughs> is it tom <laughs> surprisingly the uh the uh the, the sermons that begin with the how big is your god question yeah. are as disappointing as dates that begin that way. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> oh, this is another edition of Trip Says Things to see how Tom responds. All right, I'm going to ask you a question, Tom. Okay, I got some for you. You go oh, first. All right. Um, all right, so uh, Jacob said, since this title of the course is Becoming Christian, shouldn't there be some exposition and examination of what the gospel really is? I'm already a believer. I signed up for the course thinking I might give some in, get some insight as to why people should believe in the gospel. Yeah. I'm, well, I it, imagine he did not read it with the, the angst, write it with the angsty tone I gave it, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. I think maybe the folks who were putting this creed together thought they were at least giving a thumbnail sketch of what the gospel might be right. Like probably also some sort of propositional beliefs that if you didn't say yes to, you couldn't be a part of the group. But um, I think they had something like the gospel in mind. I, I'm not sure I would. Have, well, I know I wouldn't have written my presentation of what the Christian gospel would look like and have the exact same parts of the creed. But I have uh, actually a suggestion for, was it Jacob? Yeah, Jacob. Um, I co-wrote a little book with uh, Robert Loon, Bob Loon, called, uh, let's see, what do we call it? The Best News You've Ever Heard or something like that. And it's like a distillation of we th what we think is the essential beliefs of the gospel, but written at a fifth grade level. So like if this is really something you care about and you you wonder what how we should think about the gospel, um, you might check out that little book. I think it's like five bucks on Amazon, so you can't beat the price. Well, you How's you don't feel? remember anything you said in it? I, I have no <laughs> idea how I would pass. And if I had to, okay, if I had to explain to Elgin when he was in fifth grade, I could, but I, he was trained, you know? Yeah. Well, like, I actually used my daughters as proofreaders for this book and asked them if they understood. And at the time, what did you have to pay them? Junior hires, something. Uh, you know, at that time, they didn't realize they could be paid for their work. So, you know, it was uh, slave labor. And that's not quite right. But as you might guess, my understanding of the gospel has a lot to do with about God's love and Jesus revealing that love and our response to God's love. And there's love here and love there. And there's a lot of love in my understanding of the gospel. So, um, when I was a minister, I don't remember who told me this, but I'm going to attribute it to my parents because I think they did. But they said something like, as a parent, we try to choose the phrases we repeat all the time. So that they're on the playlist of things. Like, even when we say stupid things and act dumb, 
Like yeah. when you think of us, there's a number of lines that are going to be the <laughs> most frequent ones, right? And you can't pick the, what you say when you stub your toe and are tired and haven't slept enough and need to eat or whatever and get frustrated. <laughs> like those are already on their playlist, right? Oh my goodness, you know? <laughs> so then the question is what else is on the playlist, right? And, yeah. uh, and I took that to heart, especially as a minister and thought, something like Jacob's question, like what phrases am I going to repeat so much? Yeah. That if I'm, uh, when I was a youth minister or when I think about preaching or liturgy or any of that, that if you just by osmosis or with triple I, you're like, oh. so when you go into thanking God, these are the things that fit. So like you think of like the gospel, the things you really want to linger with you, the good news you proclaim, um, the things are the most true thing about you is you're God's beloved. Mm. Um, wisdom is that's true about your enemy. Uh, God has refused to be God without us. And that's revealed in the person of Jesus. Um, God should at least be as nice as Jesus. Yeah, it's one of your best lines. Like, like you know, that. like there's there are these things that I like try to repeat all the time yeah. um the biggest problem you have in life are the lies you believe mm. right and so the, anyway the like when i think of the gospel the lines that are in it have to do um with just the sheer gift of of god like they're all participatory yeah. images like the good news is that your life matters because you're mm -hmm. participating in the divine life. Your mm -hmm. pain matters because God shares it with you deeply. Your mm -hmm. joys matter because God cheers on with you. Your neighbor matters because their pains and their joy. Like you, you like yeah. this, yeah, like, I mean, and that's the the good news. That's awesome. Yeah, I, it, anyway. it reminds me of this little book that my co-author and I wrote, um, Chapter 2. It was his title, and I, I just love it. The title is, God's Not Mad at You. <laughs> I just always think, yeah, I think a lot of people in the world begin with the assumption that God's pissed off at them because they've screwed up. God doesn't like them. God's going to punish them unless, you know, maybe Jesus pleads on your behalf and says to God, you know, go easy on her. She just doesn't, doesn't know. Uh, but if you start with the notions that you've just expressed and the ones that I talk about in terms of God's love, it's a very different model of God to orient ourselves around. All right. I got a question for you. All right. Aaron asks, how does open and relational theology look at something like, I believe in God, perhaps? So kind of not sure you believe in God. Oh. And then the second question is, and what is this God? Ultimate concern, the un, he has a new word here, undeconstructable. Is it love? What is this God that open and relational theology believes in? I kind of did a little bit of that. Um, and I think I'll just stop there. Well, how would you respond to those? Okay. So, uh, I mean, I can, I, I, I pick up where all the reference are. You get like ultimate concern is to like undeconstructable Derrida, like, and then, and then it gets played out in a very John Caputo esque way, which echoes to the, I believe in God or we believe in God, perhaps um, two things. One, I think everyone that's honest has to put perhaps after everything. Sure. <laughs> right. And, and so the question is, uh, for me is are you in a space where you need to say it out loud because people might think certainty is on the menu yeah right and so and that's really true in certain religious contexts and not others so when i worked at a conservative baptist congregation in undergrad uh the first church i worked at um they projected their beliefs on me until i made it really clear i didn't and then i got in trouble <laughs> because they were really certain what was right. And they just assumed since I worked there, I probably believed it. Yeah. And if I had said, um, one of the youth had asked me a question, they were like, yeah, but with everything science is learning and all, like, how do you really know that God made the world in six days? And I was like, <laughs> oops, <laughs> what? Who told you they made it in six days? The pastor. I was like, he's wrong. 
God didn't make it in six days because that's not even in the Bible. Like it, I, like I'm like explaining it, you know, like yeah. I just took Hebrew Bible in undergrad, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and so like, sometimes you have to say perhaps because you don't know, right? Like that the other side is um, sometimes you don't say perhaps because you're missing the emotive point. Like when you withhold it. Right. So uh, like I've, you know, I've, we brought this up in the class in other ways, but like no one asks people to cross their fingers at their wedding vows, but you don't know what the other person's really ultimately going to do forever. Right. <laughs> I know people that got divorced and remarried and I was at both weddings for both people in the, in the marriage and didn't feel guilty. <laughs> and I didn't think they lied the first time. It's just, Everything in life, even till death do us part, involves this, perhaps. <laughs> right? And so and we all know that's true. Yeah. And, and so I feel like the I believe in God or we believe in God perhaps bit has to do with the context. If you've been a mainline Protestant minister, you know you don't have to tell anyone perhaps because they perhaps are nons, right, on the, yeah. the religion survey. Or they're like, I don't really believe in God, but I like the handbells. And... And so I think the context matters. The other thing I would say when it goes to like the who is part, the open and, open and relational theology believes that you can talk about a real God doing real things in a real world right. and not fall into the uh, 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 problematic onto theology Heidegger pointed out. Yeah. yeah. Um, and now it's a long excursus. So I would just <laughs> say that um, – connected to the reference to the undeconstructible the undeconstructible and open relational theology um is not one that is uh value free so mm. event ontologies for something like derrida right or uh, caputo in some ways um where the event is a rupture right and what comes in we don't know right like so the, it, the event is not a metaphysical constant it's a kind of hermeneutical event a rupture uh and then we don't know where the kingdom from and so caputo did this essay like you know a kingdom without god right like king thy kingdom come thy will be done but without yeah. god like we're the referent we don't really want to put god on it right um i think the open and relational theology is uh is a post onto theology perspective, but one in which the undeconstructible is infinite love. Yeah. yeah and so you, it, so it. you aren't like value. You aren't worried about the character or nature of the event. The event yeah. is not the issue. Like the coming of God moment to moment is not the issue. Um, that doesn't mean it's not a rupture. It doesn't mean it's not a restructuring and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh that's as short as I could do this, given that that's very my good. relationship of, uh, you know, if you think of the homebrewed Christianity JCs, yeah, just Catherine, John Cobb, and Jack Caputo, those are like the three most uh, visited <laughs> guests. And so that question was one I would say everyone should go listen to the episode from AAR if this is what you're interested in, where I asked the question to. Caputo, Keller, and Cobb at the same time at AAR, and Catherine has to pick sides between Jack and John. <laughs> I don't want to even say what she says, but I want to oh. say before you ask me the next question, I want to say something real quick for those who are listening who have probably little clue who Caputo is, onto theology, all that sort of stuff. Uh, just a little. Um, Sorry, Tom. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> Just a, a what, what am I going to call this? Just an observation that I have seen time and time again of people who grow up in a faith tradition. Here we're talking about Christianity. It's the, the tradition I, you and I know best, who are exposed to ways of thinking about God and this absolute certainty that God is X, Y, and Z. And so often that God is exactly the God who, you know, is on our side and who looks like us and all that sort of thing. And people realize the folly in that. And in their deconstruction, 
they believe the alternative is to make no claim whatsoever about God because we can't have a clue, this apophatic move. We can't have a clue about who God is. And so you should just be silent because every word is idolatrous. There is another move after that. And that's one with humility, lack of certainty, no uh, running around like we've got things figured out, making a humble claim about who this God might be. And this God actually might have some kind of real existence acting the kind of things you said. And that's the kind of move a lot, I'm tempted to say all, but at least most open and relational theologians are willing to make that second naivete, that third move in the progress that actually makes a constructive claim about God as ultimate reality or among the ultimate realities. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, sorry. It, it, one of the, one of the plays in that episode where Keller responds to Jack, she jokes, well, Jack, if God's always going on and on about us insisting, um, do we ever get to listen for the existing? Right. And I, Ooh. and that play has always been really striking to me. And you can see it in the way she mediates between kind of, you know, Caputo and Cobb's work. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I'm making value judgments, but brings together the beautiful parts of both in a, a new and vibrant way. Um, but, you know, last time I went on for about 10 minutes about how everyone should read Catherine's new book. So we, we won't excurse <laughs> us into how much Trip loves Catherine Keller. Right now. Um, so do you want a question about apophasis or uh, uh, um, as the founder of Open Relational Theology Group at AAR, uh, uh, you know, mediating minute differences between the two that Trip would find amusing as you answer? <laughs> well, since I already uh, mentioned a little bit on Applefasis, let me go with the second one. All right. But uh, I'm going to ask you the other one next. Okay. All right. So how would you respond to apophatic theology, which says you can't ascribe any positive attributes to God? That's um, what I was going to say you should wait on. I guess you ask it, so I'll, I'll say it. No, um, never mind, Tom. <laughs> Don't it. I misunderstood the way you answered your question. Uh, Paige says... She says, look, Tom, let me explain the difference in open relational theology versus process theology versus open theology. Or can you at least point me to somewhere where you've already discussed this? Because, oh, yeah, you know, this it really seems one. like it's really clear to you and Trip, which obviously it is to me. That's why I'm just expecting you to make it really clear to me. <laughs> um yeah, uh, Paige, this is hard. This is really hard because uh, people have different notions of what the core or essence of these ideas are. Now, if you start with relational theology, that's almost always something to do with God is affected by what goes on in the world. God's not just giving, God's also receiving. God's not impassable in all senses, but God is also influenced or affected. Well, that's relational thought, but open theists believe that too, and so do process and other people as well. So, uh, so it's hard to know, like, at least that's shared. The second idea of open theism, there's lots of ways to talk about that, and different people have different lists of what are the essentials in open theism. But if we just look at the word that the future is open and not yet settled, and the implication is that God is moving through time in some way like we are, well, all process folks think of that, or at least almost all, if not all. So like, that's not really a distinguishing marker between the two. Um, sometimes people will say, what is the biggest difference between a self-identifying process person and the self-identifying openness person and usually relational is having to do with how would they understand God's power? Like most process people are willing to make starker claims of what God, about what God can't do than a lot of open and relational folks. But even that one is like, there's people who bridge the two boundaries and yeah, it's really tough page. I'm sorry. I don't have a really nice, neat, clean answer for you, but um, I have a suggestion. Okay. Process people prefer breakfast burritos. Oh, no, this is pervert. They prefer, they like biscuits the best. <laughs>
<laughs> I see. I've never noticed that. <laughs> this is not a, like a, a qualitative study or anything. Like, <laughs> it's just a hunch I have, namely about the people I know that went to Claremont and Drew and GTU's preferred breakfast meal versus the, the larger concentration of open theists that are in the South. Um, All right. This is news to me, but I'll say this page, the phrase, you that like Tripp burritos. And, <laughs> oh, <that's> just... <laughs> the phrase that Tripp and I have been using this phrase open and relational. I think of that is like an umbrella, like a kind of a broad category that excludes some ideas, but includes a lot of other ones. And under that umbrella, I think of process theology, openness theology, some feminist theology, some post-colonial theology, some black, the all kinds of possibilities, liberationists. But what they share in common is these, the idea that God, you know, the future is open. God doesn't predetermine it, even foreknow it. And God is truly relational. So if, if that helps, um, it probably doesn't help entirely, but it gives you an idea of how Tripp and I are using the language in this class. It, and I think we use the phrase open relational just because um, unlike large portions of the church, there is a group of theologians from different denominations and traditions who right. all equally share in the title and everyone's right. still figuring it out. Right. Like, yeah, it's relatively new. Um, so uh, in the fact that people like you and I, who come from a tradition that wouldn't immediately go well done good sir right to everything we say but also <laughs> like just don't like apply labels to us that you know, like like we are kind of like figuring out what the open relational perspective is yeah and the coolest thing i think about this class is like even though you and i are thinking like here's how i might say it or here's how tom might say it or whatever in our heads the people we're thinking of does this work for involves people that are Pentecostal, Catholic, mainline Protestant, evangelical, and everything in between, right? Yep. So and not even not even just Christian. Um, exactly. Muslim, there's Muslim open relational, Jewish open. I assume there's Hindu. Oh, not ones that like the one. Apostles' Creed. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to change that, though, Trip. We're trying well, no, to change. I that. just meant. <laughs> I, I, if that's what we will win, if one non-Christian person one set to this but i was like after this i'm just uh i can uh i can go half seas on the creek like i'll there's at least five of the lines if tom well, tells it to me i'll go for it well actually what you said there identifies another category of people that i think are probably some of them are part of this group they don't really identify as christian or any faith tradition they believe in god they like this open and relational perspective, but they wouldn't pin their, their roots down on any one faith yeah. tradition. And that's a growing category of people who are attracted to the vision of God that we're suggesting here. Yeah, I think, I think sometimes um, the label you pick has to do with what kind of baggage you have. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So like this is like literally, if you've been oppressed by the Christian tradition, we're going to work through some omnipotence issues and some Greek metaphysical issues while going line by line through their witness sheet. This is literally the Roman road, right? Like it didn't even use the Bible. It just told you how things ended up. Yeah. Um, can I ask you one question before we end? Cause like, yeah, go for it. Someone asked, and there were a number of questions after the Abba episode and then the oh. almighty one where like, some of the questions seem like they didn't realize we didn't invent the creed, you know, so we were stuck talking about the, the labels that were there. Right. And like everything that said, I was like, yeah, yeah. But you don't understand. I pitched to Tom talking about the creed. If you had said, could you come up with 10 sentences that every open relational theologian gets really excited about and give three different ways they mean it? Yeah, that's a different game. Yeah, but this is yeah. a creed. And so uh, because um, and you even had had a a, 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 a a friend send in all the different ways El Shaddai was translated. 
Right. Okay. So yeah. then Shout I thought out of, to Randy Bynum there. Shout out to Randy Bynum. Oh, it's high quality. I got to, yeah. once we work out exactly what the different theological maneuvers for the different translations are, we got to come up with a high quality graphic. <laughs> but they definitely equal things I hate about theology. <laughs> um, but, okay. So we've been assuming the creed. So then we had this session last time where we had to talk about almighty and the father. And I realized that is like basically spending two hours talking about the most triggering aspects of Christianity <laughs> to anyone that's ever been harmed. So the fact that anyone asked a question about it, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Because uh, in, 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 I mean, I briefly mentioned like, I don't even predicate these types of things to God or, and which is definitely a nerd dismissal. I realize, <laughs> but okay. So in them both, we talked about how father and I could immediately go to Abba, right? Yeah. Um, Almighty. We talked about how it came from El Shaddai and I went through the genealogy later and then essentially Everything else that I really meant, you're like, that's why I think it means almighty. And <laughs> everyone that hears almighty does not think all the features of El Shaddai in Hebrew um, yeah. go to it. But here are three things about the move from Abba to Father or El Shaddai to Almighty that made me think these are the things open and relational theologians complain all the time about. Right. Okay, so both Abba, El Shaddai are names right at the as theologians that are given by their self-testimony names right god literally says i'm el shaddai in the hebrew scriptures and jesus says i call god abba so much and so frequently that they don't even translate it to another language hmm. right so abba and el shaddai should have been cornerstone things second point they're changed away from personal intimacy language to father not yeah. abba daddy type of thing but to father and not el shaddai mother's breast mountain refuge the holy tetons none of that this almighty yeah and so they're both changed away from the intimate relational intimacy vision of open relational third if you kept el shaddai and abba the creed would have the beautiful fusion of the divine masculine and feminine sitting right next to each other Nice. Oh, Abba like El Shaddai. And, yeah. and so when I thought about like, I resisted father and said, Abba, you said, give me almighty, but I'll really mean El Shaddai. <laughs> <laughs> that, but underneath it is this vision that like what we were advocating for, even though we took different tactics, was what you would think of uh, in this open relational vision, one that actually holds yeah. the particularities of these different energies of masculine and feminine, which is different than anyway, I don't, you understand the energy. Part. I like that. Uh, let me add one thing. I agree with everything you said, and this is not like a, this is sort of a, a tack on. I think when you made your presentation about the meaning of Abba, ultimately what you care about is the intimacy piece. Uh, whether or not this intimate being is male, female, non-gendered, that's important. But I think that's why you like Abba, Jesus chooses Abba. That's that intimate, personal, in the positive sense of personal. I, I, I think that's the nugget, at least for me. I want to hold on to the intimate one. And for me, mm -hmm. the, the El Shaddai, the Almighty stuff, what I want to hold on to is something about God being an influencer. God having some kind of making some difference. I'm, I want to shy away from these views of God, which God's a do nothing. Um, and so that's why I was trying to retain some kind of notion of almighty without having any of the usual connotations of that word, because I, I don't, I, I don't want to, I don't think God's a do nothing one. God's an intimate one who acts, acts on our behalf, out of love. We add all these things to it. What, what would you say to that? Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. In, in, um, in New Testament studies, there's like this ongoing debate about what to do with Abba. And oh. there's kind of like, you know, two camps. There's like the, 
Yakim Yeremias camp who what name dropping new testament so it, there's the <laughs> the new testament scholars that think the fact that it's aramaic and stayed and then there's a considerable portion of other uh contemporaneous uses of abba that signal it as more of a uh child talking to parent language like mm, like yeah. when my kids say dad daddy yeah right that's different than father right like you get the difference between the two like one is like i have a problem with you father you know or daddy yeah, yeah. like do you want to cuddle and watch a movie i'm like yeah i kind of do yes. yeah <laughs> right so abba is uh Yakim Aramias and company um, are on that side. Others are like, well, it shows up in these other ways. Maybe it was preserved because of uh, early church uh, prayers that people know Jesus prayed. And I'm like, I don't know how that ruins the other argument. Um, I have another friend who's New Testament scholar here at University of Edinburgh. Like when I went back and forth on like, I was like, yeah, yeah but I really just want you to sign off on something so I can say it and then like make you responsible for the consequences. And he's like, I don't like doing this with theologians. And I was like, yeah, but when Jesus, if you asked him today, what do you think about ultimate reality? What would, what do you think Jesus would say? He's like, Ooh. well, ground of being. No, no, no. He, he was like, you like, but you realize Jesus is not like, you know, he goes into like how he's not in our own time period. I'm like, yeah, yeah I get yeah. all that. I'm a philosophical theologian. I can fix all of that part. I just need you to tell me this other part. Like when he says Abba, after all the other things in the Hebrew scriptures, what is he meaning? And he goes, well, it's a preferential option for uh, uh, covenantal care over, over any type of top-down power relation uh, oh, that's nice. structured by state mediation or by ontological mediation. And I was like, have you said this somewhere? I'll totally footnote that. He's like, yeah. no, it just seems, it seems like clear, like to say like the distance of our distinction, because everyone knows God's bigger than you is a parental distinction is very different than saying like, I'm the truth and you suck or yeah, yeah. like I made everything and you suck. You're like like yep. all the other distinctions are ones where the gap doesn't imply intimacy. And I was like, are you an open and relational biblical scholar? <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm Scottish Presbyterian. I was like, well, you should be. But anyway, I mean, I just say all that because uh, I do think the intimate, the parental intimacy part is part of it. And I also think like, just as a Christian, um, I don't, I don't know how I'm trying to think of a way to put this. So El Shaddai is one of the few things in all of Hebrew scriptures that testifies to God telling you who God is. Yeah. Yahweh is another one, right? Like there's, what well, I guess four, I think names in the Hebrew scripture. Um, when it goes to Jesus and it's literally not even in Greek. And Jesus, the one we call Christ, Son, Lord, says, Abba. Then I just think there's a different weight to it than other images or metaphors because it's the prized one of the one we participate in, language for God. Yep. No, but I, I also want to say the relational intimacy can be normative without the linguistic parody sure yeah i think that's right yeah I but think for the church all of them went yeah 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 but i would just so like some of the questions that were around it i just want to be like when i say abba i literally mean a god as beautiful as the one jesus called abba. <laughs> like it's <laughs> well and, and those who are listening <laughs> those who are listening to you explain this right now are going to get uh, a, a full plate when you talk about uh, the passage jesus christ uh, god's son our lord so so there you go there's a there's a teaser 
if you're not a part of this class yet and you're listening to this Q&A, uh, you need to get in, on board to hear Trip explain this more fully in the upcoming episode. I know. So if I ever write a third book on Christology, <laughs> I have a new way to organize it. Good. <laughs> you but probably sadly, will. Tom, I have three other ways of organizing Christology books that I came up with. Oh, my. I know. I know. I, uh, no. I have a hard time organizing other books, but Jesus related books, Tom, you know what I really want? If, if I had a, like, not like God had to directly intervene type of answering prayer, mm -hmm. but just, uh, well done. Well, well done. Like kind of moment. <laughs> yes. It would be, um, someone to say, would you, would you like to write a multi-volume narrative Christology where you have a volume on each of the gospels and X? Oh, wow. And like, as long as people stayed members of homebrewed Christianity, <laughs> I would spend like seven or eight years doing it because I, you know, I've, uh, I spent a lot of time on it and, <laughs> and I have a hard time writing, but like, that would be like, if I had to write on Jesus again, it would have to be one that was based on specific text because I mm -hmm. like, I would send like to your, write a large narrative Christology. Send me your outlines for your three ideas. I, I'm curious. Maybe that's why you ought to decide which one to do. You send it around a bunch of your friends and they look at it and say, okay, this one looks more interesting than that one. Well, currently I'm going to write a book on the abridged book of nature. So, because oh. I, I, that's what I'm currently working on. But sure, with your Edinburgh stuff. Yeah, but I, I really think um, uh, like something that comes across like a commentary, but is really a Christology. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Or if they only want to fund me for three years, I'll do Luke X and two volumes. All right. I, look, I, I see, I don't think Abba's omnipotent, just she's creative. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Jeff Bezos is retiring from Amazon. So like, he's got a lot of money. He's got a little spare cash. He should feel really brain. guilty right now. So right after he pays everyone $15 an hour, at least with high quality benefits, he should. Isn't he a part of the space race here? So maybe if you can figure out some way Christology and space fit together. Tom, are you telling me you don't already know that my Christology is secretly about aliens? Because oh, yes. Oh, right like after this. that check cashes, it will be in the book. No, <laughs> <laughs> oh anyway that was fun i i like answering questions with you i and, like it too um, also i i'm very much anticipating your doctrine of creation book um oh. god always creates out of the previous moment in love everlastingly that's high quality material oh, thank you no. thank you I, I felt bad that I liked it so much. I couldn't argue with you in that session. It just turned into <laughs> inappropriate excitement. <laughs> well, I'm about half done with that book, uh, but I started it four years ago. And since then I've written several other books. So I got to get back and finish it off. <laughs> it, it's okay. The whole homebrewed series came out between when I put my dissertation proposal was approved and when it was done. <laughs> I was like, but you don't get paid to write your dissertation, Tom. No, no, no. But they keep they keep giving you student loan payments if you're working on it. I don't understand how this. I've <laughs> problems with our economic structure. Nonetheless, if you want to hear Tom's next half of Tom's next book, you should join the class. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, Any final words? Not anything other than just saying i also enjoy doing this with you trip thanks a lot for making it possible yeah and if you're listening and not in the group because you know you haven't joined yet go to openrelationaltheology.com and you can just email me trip at homebrewedchristianity.com 
if you have questions you want us to talk about. Um, yeah. And also, you know, if you're in the group already, this episode and the other episodes, feel free to share those with other people. We're not like, you know, keeping track of who's in and who's out, who's paid, who's not. Uh, this is a, this is a, an act of love. Ooh, which if you understand Tom correctly, is what the, what God's always up to. Preach it, brother. That's how God always <laughs> engages the previous moment, everlastingly. So Everlastingly. Um, I hope that lingers because this very moment that you're listening to this, the moment I'm saying this and the moment you're hearing it, and if you hit that back 30-second button, when you re-listen to it, <laughs> God is still <laughs> invested with love and what's going on. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll talk to you later. <laughs>